people are interested, so uh, I'm happy to uh, run this conference this year because uh, we have uh, much more participants from other countries than in previous years, and uh, it's a big uh, pleasure and horror for us that uh, here in St. Petersburg uh, now we have uh, people from not only uh, Russia but also from uh, Europe, from Turkey, from United States, uh, from Northern Europe, and uh, I hope you will enjoy many interesting uh, talks. And we have uh, four keynotes. Two will be tomorrow. Two will be today. And uh, at the beginning, I will ask uh, Daniel Barkis, uh, head of uh, Russian office PwC, to give some uh, small opening talk. Good morning, Ultra Dome. That's all I can say about Central in Russian. I apologize. So uh, you have to stay with my English, which is of course a mix between Switzerland, Czech, and a little bit of English I learned somewhere around the countries. So I have the pleasure to give a little bit of an overview of uh, what all these three things about uh, the web, the open platform, before actually the keynotes will be here and talk about the real issues. And I think the main reason is uh, gives a little bit of time to get all the other people into the room, you know, because uh, we usually have this academic 15 minutes before we really can start. So that's why we said at 10 o'clock we start, but in fact it's 10.30. So I just kind of like fill in the gap before we can really do the real stuff. So um, who knows W3C? Uh, there should be a few hands. And of course also the ones that have been at the school on Friday, yes over there, I remember some faces, so, and of course there, sorry. <laughs> so of course there will be unfortunately some repetition for you guys, but uh, hopefully for the other ones I will have some uh, interesting views about what we do and uh, how you could participate in the future. So, um, this picture is an interesting way to uh, look at the web and how it's transforming all the time. So when we say transforming all the time, what we mean is back in, I don't know, Late 80s, early 90s, there was this big thing about connecting the web documents together, you know, having hyperlinks. Everybody was happy, suddenly we had the big uh, growing web and everything was connected. But then actually we started to think about the idea of uh, not connecting only the documents together, but actually we want to go into something which is the web of data. So when did we have the first kind of ideas of web of data? Who can remember? I had this question before, so the guys which were in Friday, they should already know the answer. So it's actually not so long time ago, somewhere in 2008, 2009, Tim Berners-Lee presented this idea of connecting the data inside of the web together in order to grow a global space of data and basically have much more information that can be used. But data only is not what we put in maybe as a markup, using microdata, RDF, etc. into web documents. But what we see is actually the growing um, new information coming through the web of things. That means web of things could be not only smartphones, which everybody probably has today, tablets, but also TVs, video cameras, cameras in general. So everywhere we take the pictures, you know, and basically everything will be connected somehow to the web. So all these things need to be connected, that means the growing information in this space will be more and more. So that's what we say, it's always going to be new and new and we invent, invent to make sure that everything works together. So that's basically the job of W3C to make sure that we can have specifications about all those things that we can connect it to each other so that people can use it, share it, etc. So let's make a quick um, vote. Um, who has a smartphone or a tablet? I know it's Sunday morning, it's a little bit early, so exercise should be just in the afternoon. So who is using digital publishing in the sense reading electronic books? Yeah, good. So you see that actually today in our life we have all those information being together with us. Now the next tricky thing is who from you is contributing to W3C in making sure that we have the right specifications? How many hands do we have now? Yes, thank you. So, you see now the big gap we have? Everybody likes to use it. 
be happy that there is somebody that makes a specification, but nobody really is helping here now in Russia to give us those specifications to help in the group. So that's actually the motivation this morning to make you aware that we need people that work with us in the working groups to make those specifications so that web over TV or smartphones, mobile web, all those things are working the way you think. So if you're working for a company that needs this kind of information, it is good that you participate in W3C in order that we have the correct specifications in the future. So, who knows this picture here? Okay. I don't want to ask again for raising hands, otherwise you think, okay, we are here like a, I missed the door because EC Fit is just about 20 meters uh, on the other side there to go to the fitness and gym. So what do we try to say here? When we say the web of uh, things or the linked data, what we want is actually moving from what Tim Berners-Lee said in the early days from a one-star model to a five-star model. What is the major difference? The one-star model basically says we have something like data which is open license which can be used but not really in a form that it's machine readable so if you look it could be some document that somebody has scanned put in a pdf document and this pdf document is on a web page so of course we as a human assuming we understand the language we can read the text and we understand what's inside but for us as computer scientists this is not really of a big help so what we need to do is we should move in something what we call the two-star model and have information that is now machine readable, could be in a proprietary format like, for example, Excel sheets. But even better would be if you go to a three-star model, that means have it in an open format. This could be, for example, CSV files. So that means now we can start to read this information. But even better is the four-star model, of course. And this is to give everything a direct access that it has a URI. We will hear more about URIs and all the other concepts during the next few days. And last but not least, the best model, of course, the five star, the general in the military, you know, the top guy, is of course the model that says not only I can access those information through a URI, and I understand it, it has a clear format, for example, using RDF to make specifications of the vocabulary and the ontology behind it. But of course, we also want that this information is connected to other information on the internet or on the web. And this means now we have really the linked data uh, approach. That means we connect interesting things together that if somebody discovers our information, we immediately lead into the next information so that we really get this graph of connected data inside of the web space. So this would be, of course, our vision that we like that everybody is trying to achieve not only governments, but also industries and everybody which maybe makes his own blog, that when he writes something, he make it accessible, readable, understandable, and linked to other important data. What I mean by that is very simple, and I'm not going to talk too much about this in detail, but if you have different data sets on the web, so we want to make sure that those data sets are connected together. And there's a lot of those kind of information which is today available, and actually the next Keynote speaker will talk a little bit about the linked data, the LOD cloud, and give you much more detail in this. So just keep in mind, connections of information means we want that one data set is connected to another one, using standard vocabularies, URIs, that everything is dereferenceable, so we can understand and use this information for us and for our consumers. Good examples actually are already out in the market, so I actually was, when I was preparing the slides yesterday, I was thinking if I should show the map of the world to see who is contributing actually how many data sets. But then I saw a huge geographical space representing Russia, but no data sets available for the community. So I said maybe it would be a little bit too tough on a Sunday morning, especially when Putin has birthday today, you know, to bring up this information. So he might be embarrassed because he said once, together with Medvedev, let's go and publish data sets, make an open government uh, approach also in Russia. But if I look at the existing available data sets, there will be nothing on there really that we can use. But USA and UK and other countries are living this. And for example, this here is a screenshot taken from uh, the US uh, environment where they have today over 400,000 data sets which are publicly available, open, which means we can consume this data. And this here actually shows that there is a huge community of uh, 
clever geeks or programmers that have started to develop applications around these data sets. Over 400 million has been de developed in revenue using those data sets. So you see there's a kind of new economy being built around those data sets and those public information. Another example here is from the city of Chicago, so it's not only just the government itself, you know, Ministry of Economy or whatever, transportation, but each city starts to work on this approach to open up these data sets because they want to involve people in their activities. This is an example taken from the Chicago data set which shows crime statistics of the city. So it could be interesting if I, as Daniel, move suddenly to Chicago. I know nothing about Chicago, but I can now, uh, of course, consult the web page and say, show me which areas of Chicago has what kind of crime statistics. Shall I really move into this neighborhood? Of course, transportation systems are connected. Or, for example, showing me what kind of schools or what kind of kindergartens are around there, so if you have kids and you want to send them. So all these things now could be connected together and represented not only on web page, but also, of course, on our smartphones, where basically everybody of you say, I have one, or a tablet. So all these things now can be connected together and, and made visible and reusable for the community of people. So, how does we at W3C work with these kind of information? So we basically have four approaches. The first one is, on the W3C.org web page, everything is publicly available, and we distribute all those specifications. So that means everything from HTML, CSS, uh, RDF, Sparkle, so all those standards are publicly available. But of course, what I said is, it should be not only that we raise the hand, yes, I'm using a mobile device, or I have a TV which will be connected over the internet and all these things, but that you also say it would be nice to participate and work in groups. So the next level what we have is the working groups where experts from the industry come together and work together on the new specifications of version 1.1 to 0, etc. And of course there are many of those groups, there we have approximately 60 active groups where we do specifications and release them always on time for the community. And the benefit of course is if you are part of such a group, and you're working in a company, now let's take a very simple example. Is somebody here from Yandex? No? So, but Yandex just released the browser. So it would be good if Yandex had been on the beginning in the working group to know exactly what it means in the new version of HTML5 and CSS. But if they're not part of this group, so they just rely on what is publicly available and maybe miss already the next new hype of the specification. So if you're part of the group, you're always a little bit ahead of the new things that will arrive and you can make sure that your product is on time ready for the market. So that's the working groups. The next level of groups on the activities we have is what we call the business groups. Business groups try to collect people together that think about scenarios of applications and how these new applications will need support from different working groups. So it's kind of a cross uh, approach over different activities. And at the moment we have oil and gas, and surprise, surprise, nobody from Russia is there, even that, you know, Russia is the biggest oil and gas uh, supplier, but nobody is really there and helping. So at the moment we have mainly European and uh, companies from the US doing those specifications, and I was actually trying to push some of those guys in Russia to be part of it, but somehow they don't like me or they don't like W3C. I have to find out. Maybe I didn't drink enough vodka with them to convince them. So I have to find out the proper approach. So business groups is a new activity where you uh, connect business scenarios together and make specifications in this part. New, but growing. Last but not least is what we call community incubator groups. So these are new ideas that you try out in the sense that you get people together, discuss it in chat rooms in the wikis, and once you think, ah, oh, this could be an interesting topic that needs real specification in the sense to have a charter, that we have to connect all the important leaders in the industry. So then, out of the incubator groups, you basically push it into a uh, working group. So, these are the main activities we do in W3C to support the community. And at the end, what does it mean, you know? Uh, we are a non-profit organization, but of course we have employees that are working there, so we have to pay them, so unfortunately we need some money. So either we get money from sponsorships, or of course we try to get memberships, 
So that's how you can participate. Join W3C, pay some membership, work in a working group or a business group, and be part of this family of changing the web for the future. So that's basically the end of it.